<laughs> good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to today's Pocket Talk session featuring the Philippines. I am Al from Informal Markets, and I will be your MC for today. Before we officially begin, please take note of the following reminders. All microphones and videos of the attendees will be automatically muted. If you have any questions to our speakers, please type it on the Q&A box, which you can see at the top of your control panel section on your screen. We will select a few questions that our speakers could answer during the Q&A session. Should there be any internet disruption during the session, please be patient and try to sign in again. Today, we will be focusing on solutions and the latest technologies available in upcoming in the Philippine water industry and how these innovations can address the these current issues. To start the session, let's welcome our first presenter. Engineer William Asinta One is a graduate in DS Mechanical Engineering and DS Electrical Engineering and a consistent top notcher of four government board examinations. He had over 12 years of teaching experience in universities, colleges, and engineering review schools. Engineer One is the national president of the Noble Advancement of the Mar Marvelous People of the Philippines Incorporated, a non-government organization with advocacies in rooftop solar use, rainwater harvesting and flood mitigation, reuse of gray water for uh, sustainable living and the preservation of natural resources, electrical and fire life safety, improvement of transportation and traffic mitigation, among others. He is also the founding president of the Philippine Society of United Master Plumbers Incorporated, now the largest accredited professional organization of plumbing practitioners. He is also the interim president of the Philippine Integrated Plumbing Engineer Society, or PAUS an umbrella organization of plumbing practitioners and professionals. Please welcome Engineer William Jacinta Wan. Good afternoon, Engineer Wan. Sir, please uh, turn on your, uh, your microphone so we can hear you. Yes, hello. Yes, you can hear you now, sir. Please take the floor. Okay, thank you. Please uh, share my uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, uh, this afternoon we will be discussing how we could probably uh, help mitigate uh, flooding as we have uh, seen in the past uh, days and weeks. The Philippines, uh, most especially the areas close to Metro Manila, as well as those areas in the northern side, northeastern side, especially the Cagayan Valley, were inundated by heavy rains and uh, severe flooding. Next uh, slide, please. So this is just showing how the uh, the cycle of water uh, moves. Uh, we have the evaporation, of course. Then we have the rains. Uh, the clouds are formed, and then the rains. And then water is uh, uh, reaches uh, usually the the soil and the foliage, the forest. Uh, but uh, of course, we know very well that uh, our country, the Philippines, now is uh, uh, lacking of uh, foliage or forest cover. Next slide, please. And this results to this problem in the previous years. Next slide, please. And uh, some of our dams have been uh, heavily silted as this one. Next slide, please. And therefore, uh, because we do not uh, really put uh, adequate uh, water management overall, then we, we are plagued with this kind of a problem almost annually. Next slide, please. And so with this uh, picture of the uh, Cagayan Valley area in the, uh, during the recent Typhoon Ulysses. Next slide, please. Here is the, my topics more uh, uh, discussed um, mostly on the area of the Marikina River, which uh, for so many years has been uh, uh, plagued with this flooding. Now, the last time that we have this big flood was uh, in 2012 with uh, the Habagat and of course the Typhoon Ondoy in uh, 2009. And uh, again, uh, it was repeated with the Typhoon Ulysses over uh, weeks ago. Next slide, please. 
Here is a picture of the river basin of the Marikina River. So, by the way, uh, this uh, kind of a problem of flooding is also similar with other areas of the country where you have uh, big rivers uh, or long rivers, uh, even with the Pampanga River, which is next in central Luzon, all the way it comes from the Sierra Madre, of course, Cagayan River, uh, the Agno River, although uh, it's less of a problem because there are three dams in that uh, in that area, but in uh, Mindanao, the Agusan, and in Cotabato, even in Panay, uh, they experience heavy flooding. Next slide, please. So how can we help prevent future flooding? Next slide, please. Number one of my suggestion is low level dams. And this could be uh, uh, taken up by the government. The government needs needs to build dams, low level dams, and the upstreams of the rivers, especially this Marikina River and its tributaries, including the Nanka, the Ampid, the Mango, Montalban, Wawa, Bosoboso, and other um, uh, uh, tributaries of the Marikina River. So this can also be applied with, let's say, the uh, Cagayan Valley, uh, Cagayan River, where you have uh, there's only one dam in there, the Magat Dam, and there are so many other uh, tributaries of the Cagayan River. I think there are about six or seven tributaries, which must also be provided with dams. It was only during the time of President Marcos years ago when uh, these kind of projects were implemented. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is just a picture for those who are not technical. Uh, if you do not provide a dam along the river course, uh, what will happen is that uh, water will just flow, uh, rush down the river, and then will flood the uh, lower uh, the lower portions of the of the areas, just like uh, the Marikina River uh, uh, barangays, no, like uh, Tomana and Malanday, and of course the upper portions like. Uh, San Mateo and Montalban, the ones close to the rivers, were flooded. And also uh, Pasig City, Cainta, and uh, parts of uh, Lower Antipolo were also flooded. Next slide, please. Here is another uh, uh, picture of uh, the tributaries of the Marikina River. So you would see the upper stream in Antipolo, you would already see five of these tributaries. And then, of course, lower down, you would see the, the Nanka, the Ampid, and the Mango. And there is the main, where the Wawa Dam is. So there's only one dam actually in this uh, Marikina River. So there is a need, therefore, for putting up these dams. And uh, maybe the MWSS can take the lead in um, also uh, constructing this with the uh, uh, possibility of supplying additional water for Metro Manila. Next slide, please. Here is a picture of the Wawa Dam. So you would see that uh, whatever was constructed many, many years ago is still the same as of today. There is a project of uh, or a proposal by the, uh, I think the Razon Group, and I hope uh, it will be implemented uh, soon. Next slide, please. And there is also the projects for the uh, Kaliwa Dam and the uh, Laiwan, Laiwan Dam, which must be implemented likewise. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is a, a closer look at the two dams, Kaliwa, smaller dams, and uh, uh, Laiwan. So by uh, constructing or using these dams, then uh, there will be lesser water that would rush down to the Laguna Lake and therefore lessen, uh, help lessen flooding in the shorelines of the Laguna Lake. Next slide, please. Oversiltation, this is a centuries old problem, not only in the Philippines, but all other areas where there are uh, all countries where you have the rivers. No? And uh, throughout the centuries, uh, uh, the silt has grown so thick and I know it was planned before in 2009 to uh, dredge the Laguna Lake but unfortunately due to politics the proposed uh, dredging 
development was stopped. So uh, this must be uh, studied, restudied again and considered again so that uh, uh, it could be, uh, it could help reduce flooding in the future. Next slide, please. Yes, dredging, as I've mentioned. Next slide, please. So you will see that uh, the Laguna Lake, with the, so many tributaries emptying to it, so therefore, uh, uh, therefore there is the need also to uh, create uh, uh, another way of uh, of uh, lessening the water there when there is this big flooding. These were just proposed uh, spillways before during Marshall Law, but they were never realized. But uh, today we're going to suggest another way. Today, this cannot be possible anymore, especially the, the Paranaque Spillway, um, because uh, the cost of constructing it would be too expensive with the, so many developments in the area. Next slide, please. So, uh, like I said, long-term solution is dredging, but uh, million, billions must be budgeted for it. So we need the government to study this and consider it. Otherwise. Uh, we are of no help. Next slide, please. So here is our suggestion to utilize a part of the C5, which is there already, uh, was constructed during the mid-1990s, the mid uh, during the time of President Ramos. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, cross-section might not be so big because the Tigrid River is not a big river. But uh, it can be enhanced. It can be enhanced by uh, improving uh, flow in the Tagig River, and then of course it will connect uh, through underneath a tunnel, proposed tunnel under the C5, and all the way to the Naia, and uh, it would run alongside the Naia runway, so that there would be less effect on traffic during the construction. So. Uh, of course, tunneling is quite expensive, but this is the only way where we could suggest or propose a means of helping the Pasig River uh, empty the Laguna Lake when there is big volume of water that is stored in Laguna Lake. Next slide, please. Yes, this is uh, what I explained earlier. Next slide, please. Another infrastructure that we are suggesting is to construct underneath the the um, JP Rizal in Marikina all the way to Amang Rodriguez all the way to the Mangan Bloodway. Why is this important? Yes, because this portion here, which is the Provident Village, is uh, uh, every now and then being flooded because of the of this portion of the river where you know this portion used to be flood plains before but when it, it was converted to housing then uh, perennial flooding would come in with the uh, heavy rains next slide please next slide please so this is a schematic of what we're talking about a proposed underground tunnel from uh, that bend portion in uh, the Provident Village all the way to the Mangahan Floodway. In other words, the flood waters there that accumulates in the Provident Village could be could be helped, could be uh, uh, mitigated, could be reduced by directing it to the Mangahan Floodway. It must be an underground okay. tunnel in order to. Uh, uh, not to uh, affect the existing, uh, the present traffic in the area. Next slide, please. Okay, so there is a need also to build more pumping stations, especially when uh, uh, around the lake, of course, no? especially when the, 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 the canal to uh, or tunnel to the uh, Manila Bay would be constructed, but then there is a need for this also. Next slide, please. Government should adopt strong measures to prevent squatting along lake shores, river banks, creeks, the steros, or other waterways. Next slide, please. 
severe erosion. How to solve this? Like I said, this is also centuries old, but uh, there's still a solution to this, and that is tree planting. Uh, we suggest uh, there would be um, a more stringent means of adapting this. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, this can be this can be undertaken by the government as well as non-government organizations. I belong to the Rotary Club of Pasig North and the uh, District 3800 and uh, the district, Rotary District uh, 3800 has been uh, doing this tree planting for so many years. Ever since I became a president in uh, 2005, I've been uh, attending uh, tree planting in the mountain sides of uh, the Sierra Madre in Tanay and elsewhere. Also my other group, Pogad Lawin, this is also an NGO also doing it, but uh, and I know there are also other groups doing it, but it seems like uh, our efforts to uh, attain a forest cover, because I know we leave that uh, to develop a forest cover, um, it would take a hundred years. So it, it really takes a long time. So next slide. So we have a suggestion. Next slide. And uh, of course, uh, uh, not only graduates in the school should be re should be required to plant trees, but also maybe uh, prisoners, they could be used to plant trees as well, uh, so that they could be also more productive while in prison, while in correction. Next slide, please. And my suggestion is also to use drones to uh, uh, propagate the seeds, no? Uh, we have seen that uh, planting planting the seedlings, the tree seedlings, is not totally effective because we've seen, although they've been planted, but later on they would be, uh, they would die later because of lack of uh, of uh, care after they were planted. So I think the one way of probably uh, trying to get the chance of uh, propagating these trees is by um, collecting seeds, uh, various seeds, especially the fast-growing seeds like the ipilipil, the gemelina, the falcata, the bagras, or pine trees, and they could be scattered in the mountain sides by drone technology. Of course, uh, it must be uh, studied further when would be the best time to scatter this, and it must be done uh, continuously uh, during the after the rainy season when. Uh, when uh, the strong rains are already over. Next slide, please. Incentives must also be given to people who can do uh, tree planting, you know, especially those who are traveling to the mountain sides. We see a lot of our countrymen motoring or biking to, uh, to the mountain sides and they could be given uh, incentives when they do tree planting, especially the, the fruit trees. Next slide, please. So we can also offer alternate livelihood to our uh, brothers and sisters who are Dumagats or Itas because uh, uh, these people who, who are not uh, um, uh, able to raise uh, their uh, uh, living by other means except they would do kaingin, that is the cutting of the trees and burning them and uh, making charcoal. Uh, and some other means, no? So uh, the government can adopt measures to uh, teach them uh, alternate farming like uh, moringa, moringa trees, the malonggay, and other value crops uh, with the government uh, providing the necessary uh, system on how to uh, uh, buy their products so that they would be encouraged uh, to uh, uh, evade or avoid the kainin or the charcoal system, which already usually inundates our or uh, or um, deletes our forest, and of course, stringent laws must also be passed by Congress, maybe increasing the the penalties, uh, making it as a crime punishable by heavier fines. Next slide, please. And of course, there will always be more people and more houses because of the, the increase in population. The time when the Mangaan floodway was constructed in the 1980s up to today is already uh, 40 years. So you could imagine 
our population has already more than doubled, I bet, I think, especially in Metro Manila, where uh, uh, most uh, there are so many settlers coming from the province, increasing the, the volume of uh, the population in Metro Manila. So therefore, there should be more uh, uh, strategic means of how to uh, uh, counter this, maybe uh, uh, encouraging people to uh, go to the countryside. That's one. And of course, uh, uh, next slide, please. There should also be the need for better urban planning. Like, for example, uh, I see the model of lecture in Mexico, Pampanga, and Nobali in uh, Santa Rosa and Eaton Park in Santa Rosa, where they have a man made lake in there. A man made lake in a uh, gated subdivision can. Uh, hold the flood waters during heavy rains. Uh, of course, it will it could take uh, some cost, but uh, this is the only way where uh, some uh, some subdivisions, no, like the Karangalan, like uh, the uh, the Green Park, can also be um, uh, uh, you know improved by uh, having this. Uh, uh, artificial uh, lakes or what uh, or pools so next slide please and of course the government should uh, be specific be, be um, strict with the HLURB probably uh, controlling uh, the development of, uh, of flat areas the low level areas for subdivision housing uh, this low level areas especially the the the, the former, uh, the, which are pre presently are uh, uh, floodplains or even uh, farms, uh, rice farms and other uh, flat areas uh, should be elevated first before being constructed, be before being uh, uh, converted into a housing subdivision. Next slide, please. And we should um, encourage rainwater harvesting and uh, the provision of rainwater tanks by homeowners of course uh, i uh, i like to uh, cite uh, the city of cebu where they have an ordinance that uh, requires uh, homeowners uh, their own uh, to put up their own rainwater tanks no mandatorily so this must also be adopted by other uh, lgus uh, especially within the in the areas that are uh, affected usually by uh, uh, flooding uh, like uh, Montalban, San Mateo, Marikina, again Pasig, Cainta, Lower Antipolo and of course uh, Taytay and all other towns within the uh, around the Laguna Lake and similarly in those other areas that are usually flooded. Next slide please. And here's just samples. I just uh, took them out from the internet. Next slide, please. And it is also possible to have uh, rainwater injection to the aquifer. So this is just a schematic or a, a drawing showing how it could be done. Uh, instead of uh, collecting it in a water tank, the water, the rainwater is filtered first and injected to the water aquifer. Next slide, please. And what other means? What other means that uh, homeowners can do? Oh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, planting the bamboo trees or reed plants along uh, side rivers and creeks and waterways. Next slide. It's a good thing because the bamboo has a capacity to hold big volume of water as compared to other uh, plants. So. The reed plants and the bamboo plants. Next slide, please. This, these are just reed, uh, pictures of reed plants that I'm talk, uh, what I'm referring to. Next slide, please. And same with this. Next slide. And we we can also create vertical gardens at our homes, at our buildings. Next slide, please. And it's just uh, an example. Uh, this is uh, a fence where the owner put a lot of, uh, of plants grown vertically. Next slide, please. 
and of course this is uh it might be too much to have this but uh if it can be done why not next slide please next slide please and parking areas we've seen a lot of parking areas where they are uh, simply cemented no uh, the suggestion is just to simply use permeable surface like uh, gravel gravel finish or uh, uh, what these tiles that are that uh, really cemented together so that would allow rainwater to seep to the aquifer so there are so many other means uh, to improve it i think uh, what i uh, what I uh, presented uh, this afternoon is just uh, maybe uh, an, an idea opener so that uh, our uh, our government, our lawmakers, and those in the executive branch can probably look back again to our problem, the flooding problems. It's a very, very big problem. And of course, uh, we as uh, professionals, we can also do something. Uh, to include the rainwater tanks in our design and also sustainable design in the in the uh, sewage treatment so re to reuse it also and of course uh, as homeowners we can also do something by planting more trees by planting vertical gardens and many other means thank you very much and good afternoon thank you very much engineer one uh, for that um, suggestions and how we can mitigate floods, especially here in the Philippines. Um, later, we can ask you more. Um, for our attendees, please type in your questions on the Q&A box so we can ask it later to Engineer One. And now we will proceed with our next speaker, and that is Engineer Rico Ongoy. Engineer Rico Ongoy is a licensed civil and sanitary engineer. He has an extensive professional experience in wastewater collection treatment, disposal, and reuse. He was involved in various wastewater treatment plants projects as process and detail design engineer, project engineer, project manager, and project director. He was also involved in due diligence audits of local and international wastewater treatment facilities. At present, he is an environmental engineering consultant handling various wastewater treatment plants projects. Please welcome. Engineer Rico Ongkoy, Director of the Philippine Water Works Association, or PAWA. Hi, Sir Rico, Engineer. Good afternoon. Engineer Rico, please turn on your video and your uh, mic, please, so we can hear and see you. Hello, Engineer Rico. There, we can see you now, sir. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Can you uh, lower down the volume of that uh, speaker that you have? So there will be no feedback. Okay, uh, just uh, mm -hmm. remove some of my gadgets here. <laughs> it's okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, please take it away. Is that, is that okay? Yes, sir. Please take it away. Okay, can, uh, can you share my slides, my presentation materials? <clears throat> well, that, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the topic which I'm going to present today is uh, about the overview of emerging wastewater treatment technologies in the Philippines. Next slide, please. The outcome of my presentation is uh, I will uh, briefly discuss the DNR Department of Administrative Order 2016-08, which is the water quality guidelines and general effluent standards, then followed by challenges to comply with this new effluent standards. Then uh, what are the emerging or available wastewater treatment technologies for biological nutrient removal system in the Philippines? And what are also the business opportunities to comply with this with these new effluent standards? Next slide, please. Let me first uh, briefly discuss about the this DNR Department Administrative Order 2016-08. Uh, this uh, order was issued on May 24, 2016. 
then it was uh, published at, uh, after 15 days in that date of issue, issue and uh, also upon an acknowledgement of receipt of a copy hereof of the, by the Office of the National Administrative Register. So the, it, the order was become effective. So what are the objectives of this uh, department order? So one is to provide guidelines for the classification of water bodies in the country and determine, determination of time trends and the evaluation stages of deterioration, enhancement in water quality, evaluation of the need for taking actions and preventing, controlling, or abating water pollution throughout the country, and uh, establishment and designation of water quality management areas. We call it WQMA. And uh, lastly, to set the general influence standards. Next, please. So what are the scope and coverage of this order? So we, there are two, uh, we divide this into two uh, groups. We have the water, water quality guidelines. So again, it applies to all water bodies in the country, fresh water, marine waters, and groundwater. It's also used for classifying water bodies, determining time trends, also uh, covers the uh, evaluation of stages of deterioration or enhancement in water quality. Uh, one of the scope also is uh, it will be the basis for taking actions and preventing, controlling, or abating water pollution. And of course, uh, shall be used in the process of designating WPMA. Now, for general water general effluent standards, uh, it applies to all point sources of pollution, regardless of volume that is charged to body of water or land. So, meaning even the small uh, flows of wastewater or sources of pollution that is covered by this general effluent standard. And also shall be used regardless in the, of the industry category, maybe from commercial, uh, industrial, and different, uh, different industries, even uh, residential or domestic wastewater of, of, uh, are covered by this, uh, by this uh, department order. Next, please. Then, uh, what are the body classifications, water body classification, and usage of wastewater? So, uh, we have the class AA, uh, which is uh, public water supply class one. This is a uh, protected uh, body of water, wherein the red, the red uh, uh, industries are not, are not allowed or any. Uh, in the, uh, inhabitants or in that in this area, then in class A, public water supply class two, class B, we have the recreational water class one, then class C or fishery water, and recreation water class two, and also for agriculture, irrigation, livestock, and watering. Class D is for navigable water. So these are the classifications for fresh water. Now, what are, what are those in, uh, classifications for the marine water? Next slide, next slide, please. Next slide, next slide, please. Okay, so we have the class SA. So these are uh, protected waters or fishery water class one. Actually, these are used for, uh, uh, for fish breeding and so on. Uh, for uh, water for human consumption, then class SB for fishery water class two, uh, storage zones and recreational class one. So class SB is the classification of uh, Boracay, you know, uh, this uh, El Nido, Chargao, and all, all other storage areas you know, where there is a need for. Uh, uh, body water, no, uh, recreational contact with body. So class SC also for fishery water class three. Then we have recreational class water class two, 
marshy and mangrove areas declared as fish and, and wildlife sanctuaries. So they were classified as class C. Actually, for, uh, for propagation of uh, fish and aquatic resources, particularly for class C. Then class C for uh, navigation or navigable water. Next slide. This. This, is a, this is an example of the effluent standard for class C fresh water. Well, actually, the previous standard, this is uh, DAO, um, uh, DAO 35. Of the, it was uh, issued in 1995. Actually, uh, uh, there's a, there are new parameters now. So among of these new parameters, we have the ammonia, uh, ammonia nitrogen, as ammonia nitrogen. At, this is, this is a value of 0.5 milligrams per liter. DOD, we have 50 milligrams, COD, uh, polar 150 uh, pro polar unit, nitrate, nitrate nitrogen, 14 milligrams per liter. This is another one parameter now. And uh, pH phosphate is the new parameter added in the, in the general effluent standards. And sulfates or patterns, temperature, total suspended solids, oil and risk. These are part of the old uh, effluent standards. Next slide, please. So, in, in complying with these uh, new new parameters, you know, actually these are these are all uh, nutrients, you know, control of nutrients to prevent eutrophication of uh, bodies of water like lakes, rivers, and other types of bodies of water. So the DNR actually gives grace period you know, uh, of not more than five years, uh, provided that establishment or any establishment, whether commercial, in, uh, industrial, institutional, they have, they have to submit compliance action plan. So also they have to submit periodic status of implementation to the ANR for the establishments, compliance schedule within the prescribed grace period. So what does this mean, no? Uh, meaning it, this uh, department order was issued in 2016, so five years after, so uh, uh, next year, no, year 2021, would be the full implementation of this uh, department order for existing wastewater treatment facilities. Now for, for new wastewater treatment facilities, uh, compliance is actually should be from the issuance of this order. Now, moratorium on the issuance of this and this is order or closure order finds an other penalties against the establishment's operation. If this or all the establishments by year 2021, uh, I think this is uh, on June no, of this next year, if the uh, industrial establishment or uh, different establishments I will not uh, comply with this uh, new uh, employment standards, then penalties, fines, and uh, closure may be imposed by the, by the DNR. Next slide, please. Now, uh, what are the challenges to comply with, with the new employment standards? First, uh, as, as uh, maybe experienced by some uh, proponents or project proponents or, or uh, corporations or companies, no? uh, there's a need for proper selection and implementation of best available, available and practicable wastewater treatment technologies. We will discuss later on these uh, uh, different technologies. Then there is a need for upgrading of existing wastewater treatment plants because mostly uh, Existing wastewater treatment plants now or sewage treatment plants actually are more or less on the conventional, uh, only complying for uh, carbonaceous biodiesel removal, more or less. And uh, these existing uh, wastewater treatment plants are not compliant to the nutrient uh, parameters, which are ammonia, nitrogen, nitrates, phosphate. So, there's a need for upgrading this existing wastewater treatment plant. Then uh, one concern also or challenges of the different companies are limitations on 
project area for wastewater treatment plant upgrading. Particularly, of this company should like also expand. No? So, uh, in part particularly in urban areas where there's a, there, are, there are limitations on the on the land, no? the land area, which they are going to expand or upgrade their existing wastewater treatment plant in order to comply with this new effluent standards. Then another, lastly, uh, allocation of force allocation of project funds and other resources. So hiring uh, professionals, which are familiar also with the, with the biological nutrient removal systems. So these are the more or less some of the uh, challenges you know, how to comply with this new deployment standards. Next slide, please. Now, uh, what are the available and uh, emerging wastewater treatment technologies for biological nutrient removal system? Well, uh, I would like to mention that uh, now uh, existing wastewater treatment plants or sewage treatment plants in the Philippines, uh, uh, they're only dealt with uh, BOD removal of carbonaceous BOD. So usually, uh, like, uh, these technologies, as an example, are the, the conventional activity sludge process, the extended duration of the activity sludge process. And we have also the sequencing bus reactors, now, which, are, which is very popular in the Philippines. Then we have the membrane bioreactor, and we have the moving bed uh, uh, bioreactors. And all of these of this technologies, now, uh, actually now operating in the Philippines, have no, uh, are not integrated yet uh, the, by uh, the biological nutrient removal system. But some of the companies now, since the, the deadline would be next year, you know, so they are moving fast, and uh, maybe some of them are implementing you know, to incorporate or integrate biological uh, nutrient removal system. So I would like to discuss very briefly on uh, what are these uh, biological nutrient uh, removal systems. So there are two, uh, the removal of nitrogen, so we call this biological nitrogen removal processes. So among of this, uh, the modified blood sap eating or MLA process. So in this uh, diagram, we can see that we have the first process will be an offset process, then uh, followed by aeration process, then we have the settling or sedimentation process. So uh, th this is uh, uh, to remove the nitrogen, only nitrogen no, in the wastewater. So of course, an offset, uh, this is what we call the nitrification process. No? So this is a free uh, denitrification process then followed by aeration. All those settling tanks or sedimentation tanks would also function relatively as anoxic process or post anoxic. So, in this process, we will remove the uh, nitrogen uh, inversion from, uh, from uh, nitrogen, uh, uh, nit uh, nitrites, no? or ammonia nitrogen to nitrite, into nitrates, and into nitrogen gas. So, you remo will remove the nitrogen. Next slide, please. Next, next slide. Okay, so another technology uh, is the four stage burden book process. So we have the uh, we have the anoxic, we have the aeration, we have the the post anoxic, then another post aeration, then we have the sedimentation process. So well, uh, for existing wastewater treatment plants. Uh, aeration systems are uh, in place already, so you have to add an anoxic process. So there is a need for a post anoxic and also for a second aeration process. Then it can be integrated, and that this is what uh, four stage burden for process. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so now uh, for biological phosphorus removal process. So this is an example only. Uh, by the way, I would like to mention, again, okay, 
for uh, nitrogen removal process, a lot of technologies uh, in, uh, emerging or available today. No? So I just I think I just mentioned uh, a few of them. No? So this biological phosphorus removal process, uh, one of these is the 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 aerobic oxidation or no, anaerobic oxidation, or we call this for this process. No? So we need to put up an aerobic uh, reactor uh -huh. before the aeration tank. Now this is, this system will remove the the phosphorus content of the wastewater. Then followed by the sitting tank. Then effluent. Of course, effluent cannot be discharged directly. Then we have to disinfect. Uh, we'll undergo disinfection process for all effluents. Then we have the RAS or yes, the return activated sludge. Then we have the waste activated sludge for the uh, sludge dewatering and uh, further handling. Okay, next slide, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, now we have another one for, uh, now this is a biological nitrogen phosphorus removal process. So there, there, there are technologies that now available that combine the, the nitrogen and phosphorus removal. So meaning it will meet the standard both for ammonia, nitrogen, nitrate, and phosphate. So what are this uh, example of this technology is the, uh, we call this uh, A slash OT process. No, when we have the first reactor, we have the anaerobic tank, then followed by an offset tank or an offset process, then followed by aeration process. So then sedimentation. Next please. Next slide. Another uh, combined uh, Biological nitrogen post post removal process process is uh, they call this modified SBR process, meaning SBR plus the uh, integrating the biological nutrient removal process. So in, in the flow diagram we have the uh, one reactor because SBR is uh, this is a sequencing box reactor. We in the settling process also take place in the same reactor, but again uh, incorporating the BNR process. There is a need for um, mixing no? after the aeration. They have to they have to shut down the the blower, then uh, go on mixing for the nitrification process. Then that's a uh, conversion from nitrate to nitrogen gas. No? Then uh, there is no return of the activated sludge, so only for waste activated sludge. And then of course after the process with the effluent. No? Now uh, this is the ice. Uh, even now, without the biological nutrient removal system, this beer is uh, quite popular in the Philippines, and uh, a lot of them are uh, operating right now. So there is a need to uh, upgrade this SBRs, no? this uh, sequencing bus reactor, reactors, no? to comply with these new effluent standards. Okay, next please. Now, what are the business opportunities to comply with the new Fluent Standards? Number one, uh, first, uh, contractors that have capabilities to do turnkey design, construction, testing, commissioning, and performance proving of new wastewater treatment plants with DNR systems. I would like to emphasize that with DNR systems. So for new wastewater treatment plant, treatment plant projects, after the issuance of the of these new standards, so it should comply with the with the nutrient parameters, uh, ammonia, nitrogen, phosphate, and nitrates. So uh, this this is a very big business opportunity for wastewater treatment plant contractors. Another one, uh, upgrading of existing wastewater treatment plants to comply with this new standards. So I would like to mention that there are thousands of wastewater treatment plants, sewage treatment plants in the Philippines today that uh, maybe some of them are still on the planning stage to uh, uh, upgrade their existing facilities no, to comply with this new effluent standard. So this is a very big opportunity for contractors in uh, locally domestic domestically and also maybe some, of course uh, we're inviting the international uh, contractors also 
to join no? uh, helping our industry here in the Philippines no? to uh, upgrade uh, our thousands of wastewater treatment plants, sewage treatment plants uh, operating today no? in order to comply with the new current standards fully complied by next year. Although I, I can see that there, there will be a very short period of time already. So I think many companies now in the Philippines are doing their best to comply with the, with the new employment standards. You know? So there are a lot of things to do here in the Philippines you know, in terms of wastewater treatment facilities, both for uh, domestic and industrial. And even for centralized and decentralized wastewater treatment plants for urban areas. Because uh, uh, most of our cities actually have no centralized or even decentralized wastewater treatment plants now. So a lot of things to do. Uh, aside from uh, complying with the new the Philippine Clean Water Act, then of course this new uh, DAO 2016-08, the new employment standards. So a lot of things to do here. So uh, inviting all the uh, foreign, foreign contractors to help build our infrastructures here in the Philippines. So that uh, we have a very, we can have a clean environment. That's all. So thank you very much for listening uh, to my presentation. Thank you very much, Engineer Rico and Coy. I know we are already running um, over time, so uh, we would like to thank everyone who are joining us here today. But we will not end this session definitely without a question and answer session. So um, can we call on uh, Engineer uh, Juan to join us for the Q&A? Engineer Juan, please turn on your video. While we are waiting for Engineer Juan, uh, we are um, inviting everyone to please um, send in your message to our speakers um, on the Q&A box so that we can send it to them. All right. So let's start with the session. Um, this is for Engineer Juan. This is from Puranut Uisut Jin Dapur. I'm really sorry for my pronunciation, but um, here is the question. Apart from the physical measures, for example, uh, building dams, expanding the drainage system, dredging, etc., in flooding prevention, what is your view on adopting a smart solution such as a decision support system to help the operator in dealing with city flooding issues? Uh, can you repeat it again, please? Sure. Um, what is your view on adopting a smart solution? such as a decision support system to help the operator in dealing with city flooding issues, aside from building dams and uh, dredging. Uh, I think he was referring to uh, existing dams and how they could be uh, managed uh, smartly. I guess that's what he means. <clears throat> of course, uh, that is also a good way. Uh, what we have seen in the Magata problem is that uh, uh, the, the release of the waters came in too late and uh, of course the silted Cagayan River can no longer uh, accommodate the release flood, the, the water release too late. So yeah, correct, uh, that should also be included in the program. Uh, but in the case of Marikina River, we don't have yet a, uh, a dam. Uh, we only have the Wawa Dam, which is not uh, really controlled. Uh, I show it already, the picture. So, uh, but in other areas, uh, just like uh, the Pantabangan, uh, the Agno River uh, dams, uh, including the Tabinga, Buklao, and uh, the San Roque, and some other dams, yes, uh, that could also be done. But what we're talking about is uh, uh, because uh, Marikina River is, uh, is a, a, a problematic uh, watershed, no? Uh, it is already denuded. The forests are already, already denuded. So that's why we are proposing this easy solution of building low-level dams. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I think also um, the flooding is really such a relevant uh, topic recently, especially with the uh, flooding in the northern part of the Metro Manila due to the uh, recent um, 
typhoons, you know. So um, there is an emergence in our uh, social media as well as our um, television networks here about the underground flood control in Tokyo, Japan, wherein they have system of tunnels and water tanks. What do you think? Can we implement that here in the Philippines? What are your thoughts? Yes. Yes, I agree with that. As a matter of fact, the global city has its own uh, big underground uh, uh, tank there. No, uh, It should also be duplicated in some other areas, uh, especially uh, areas, uh, commercial areas that are close to the Marikina River and maybe the Pasig River that are flooded. Yeah, that's correct. And even uh, Espana Avenue, which is uh, uh, usually flooded every now and then, uh, we have suggested uh, to friends in the USD, University of Santo Tomas, that they could also convert a portion of their open uh, open field to uh, a big water cistern underneath to uh, receive the flood waters, you know, and then of course uh, they can ask the Manila Water or the Manila to manage it so they can uh, install a, a filtration system and maybe they could, uh, we could utilize the water there. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, sir. Now, this is a question to um, Engineer Ongkoy. Engineer Rico, this is from Mohamed yes. Ilham Miskon. What are the fines imposed under DAO 20608 to the industries if there is any offenses in the building? Uh, what, are, what are the... Uh, fines or uh, penalties? Fines. Penalties, under... yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, actually... Uh, uh penalties actually are already established and uh, even long before the under the, the previous uh, standards and uh, it is in the philippine clean water act implementing rules and regu regulations mm -hmm. that industries if do not comply with that uh, with the standards also with this new flowing standards uh, there will be a penalty of ten thousand uh, pesos to one hundred thousand pesos a day mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and uh, if there are any uh, parameters uh, uh, violated or meaning uh, exceeded exceed the standards, mm -hmm. and uh, the DN also actually uh, quite lenient also if, uh, uh, to uh, impose penalties. But again, if they cannot comply with a long period of time, then they can be issued a CDO, a cease and desist order. So they have to lock out, lock out your uh, industrial operations or your factories. So that's the last thing. resort. All right, thank you, engineer. You know, actually, I would like also to focus on the more positive side of investing here in the Philippines rather than the penalties. And actually, we have a, a question here from uh, Ethan Tan. So this is for also again, engineer Rico. Um, we are, he said, we are a wastewater treatment uh, specialist from Malaysia. So for international contractors looking to enter the Philippines on waste uh, water, what are the governing bodies that will be qualifying our product before they can be adopted in the Philippines? Many thanks for well, your um, Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, if you have your own technology, uh, particularly mm -hmm. wastewater treatment technology, mm -hmm. uh, it can be uh, applied with our department of science and technology the UST or we call it uh, technology validation you have that program so that uh, so that uh, all all technologies technologies before it will it will be applied here in the Philippines uh, will be uh, validated by, the, by that agency that it will work uh, it will serve its purpose so that's the uh, some one of the requirements but of course uh, uh, another thing also, the requirements of DNR. So there, should, uh, there is a uh, wastewater discharge permit. Of course, if you are going to implement your projects, uh, there's, there should be a guarantee that it will, uh, uh, all parameters will be complied. So, uh, of course, company will also require the guarantee that uh, the technology will work. Or meet the right. different standards. All right, thank you, engineer. Now, um, for uh, engineer one, um, you mentioned, sir, in your presentation earlier that um, you are really advocating for dredging and the creation of dams um, to solve somehow the, the flooding 
uh, problems here in uh, Metro Manila or in the Philippines. But as you can see, there are also some very, very few protests regarding the creation of uh, dams and uh, drenching. So especially that during the flooding um, that was caused by uh, the typhoon Banco or the typhoon Ulysses here in the Philippines, um, the majority of the public are uh, accusing that it's the dam's fault. That's why they are flooding in their cities. So um, as an expert, how do you think we can educate the public that uh, these types of solutions are the best solutions? And um, how would we explain it in layman's terms, especially for those who are not technically well versed? So that is where uh, there is a really need, real need of uh, communicating with our uh, Dumagat and the Itas there in the mountain heights to explain to them that uh, it is not uh, the dam per se that uh, creates the flooding. As a matter of fact, uh, if you have the dams, then uh, the the big water, the big the bigger volume of water has been held already in the in the mountain sides. Otherwise, uh, if there is no maga, there is no pantabangan, there is no binga, there is no uh, amboklaw or uh, San Roque dams in there or other dams, then uh, you you would have uh, worse flooding. And uh, I believe. Uh, uh, we, without these uh, infrastructures, you know, today with a big uh, population, then the, the, the problem would be so big to solve. So we need to communicate with them uh, clearly. And of course, we have to offer to them an alternate uh, livelihood. Uh, remember, if you have the dam, there is a body of water in there that holds the water. And therefore, mm -hmm. they can also race or uh, do fishing. So these are possible means of explaining to them how a mm -hmm. dump them. All right, thank you very much, engineer. Um, unfortunately, we would love to hear um, more from you guys, but uh, we are already running out of time. And for those who have sent their questions, um, you can still uh, send it to us and we will be sharing it to our speakers and they can get back to you later. But, be but before that, maybe um, engineer one, maybe a last few very short final words so that we can encourage our international community to invest in the Philippines. Okay, our uh, big thanks to the water uh, uh, event, Water Expo, which is which comes to us every uh, two years. And uh, we thank very much the organizers for continuing to uh, trust us in the, in our in our profession, the pipes and the PISAM and the MEPF organization of the Philippines. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon again. Thank you, Engineer One. How about you, Engineer Rico? Any final few words for our? Um, well, um, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, in behalf of the, in behalf of Philippine Water Works Association, we would like to thank uh, the organizer, the uh, informal market, for this uh, partic participating or partnering with this uh, Asia Water 2020, and hopefully we can uh, uh, encourage uh, foreign investors. Yeah, particularly uh, foreign contractors to help us building our infrastructure here in the Philippines. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Engineer Y and Engineer Rico, for joining us today. Um, and thank you for spending some time and sharing uh, relevant information about our respective fields. All right, for everyone watching, thank you for joining us today. And join us tomorrow for the last day of the Asia Water 2020 virtual event. Just visit the website www.virtual.asiawater.org and you can meet a lot of virtual exhibition booth and discover new networks. And we hope to see you there. We are also inviting you to watch out for Water Philippines 2021 on December 8th to December 10, 2021. For more updates, please visit our website at www.waterphilippinesexpo.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.